Andreas from AO Performance back in Stockholm, but speaking English again. Um, I'm back with many people want to hear more of you, man. So I need to bring you back over and over and over again, because uh, this is one of my most brilliant friends out there. I think I'm, I know that you are the smartest person I I met when it comes to functional medicine. And um just love to talk to you. And I know I was, we talked a little bit before I hit the record button and I said we could talk for hours and we we usually want to do it, but we're going to try to to not do several hours, maybe one hour. We'll see. But welcome back, Dr. Bob Rukowski. Well, Andreas, uh, you know, one, I love and appreciate you and your wisdom. And you know what? You've got to be not just the smartest I know, but possibly the best in the world at 3D function. So you know, well done, uh, and and your your track record, even your own family, right? Your son getting a major <laughs> contract, and like you said, didn't touch a weight, but was one of the strongest guys, or maybe the strongest guy in the entire team. That's pretty doggone amazing. So, uh, I think we've got some good synergy for your listeners. I think so too, uh, and I know so. I've been inspired by you for so many years now, and the first time I saw you on on stage in Dallas. Me and Johnny Oduya was watching you talk for for a full day. It was like an eight-hour workshop, right? It was a long day, but it was so good. I was so impressed. But we, the the thing I was most impressed about was when the doctors in there start asking questions and kind of question what you said a little bit. And the answers you had, I'm like, whoa, this guy knows what he's talking about. It was just like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn this this talk for eight hours and then i don't know anything else it was just when they asked you questions you just exploded with information and people were just blown away i was blown away and i'm proud to be your friends to be your friend ever since you know i want to say a few things about that one one i'm proud to be your friend as well and, and when we start looking at this you know jordan peterson said whenever you're going to talk you know, always talk uh, in a way where you only share just a fraction of what you know you got to have some reserve in the tank uh, and you know what, that, that's going to be applicable, whether you're on the ice or the soccer field or the football field, you know, and then when everything's just the final moments, when you give your all, you know, it, after you've given your all, you ought to collapse, right? That's uh, how to be it. So we know these athletes can't go that far, but, uh, right. you know, you, you put them in a position to give way more than everybody else and then still have reserve in the tank. It's, it's unbelievable. So it's fun. So today I'm going to, we're going to talk about, we're going to focus a little bit on vitamins today. So not a lot about minerals or other stuff. We just focus a little bit on vitamins because I've been getting a lot of questions about vitamins because people know I eat a lot of vitamins and I take supplements and I take a lot of supplements and everyone I train takes supplements. And so people ask me a lot of, which I understand because there's so much information out there. And considering you're the smartest guy I know on the planet when it comes to this, why not ask you, man? <laughs> All right. What do you think but, of that? You know, I, I, I love vitamins, right? Like, let's even just start with the word. It originally was vital amines, meaning life critical. You couldn't live without it. And then the original wow. ones they found were amines. But guess what? Some of them turned out not to be. So then they just dropped the E and they called them vitamins, but vital, essential to life. And you need all of them. You're, if you have, if you're missing one, you're going to die. If you're deficient in one, you're not going to work as well as you could. So uh, life critical and and who doesn't want a better life i think most of us want that so i'm going to start with this one because i know i mean vitamin c maybe it's the most famous maybe vitamin d too but vitamin c maybe it's the most famous one out there probably and let's say i want to take vitamin c because i i hear it's a, it's a good antioxidant and so let's break that word down. What's an antioxidant? What is that? And why is vitamin C a good antioxidant? All right. So anti is certainly against oxidant, oxidation, like the process of rusting. And we don't want to rust out. You know, we, we probably wear out before we burn out in most cases. Uh, right. And so very, very simply, oxidation is just simply the process of stealing an electron. And if you steal an electron, something that keeps a molecule or atom stable, it becomes unstable. It becomes damaged. Uh, and you know, there's something called free radical pathology. There's a pretty fun video on YouTube 
demonstrating free radicals. They they had, you know, I don't know, 100,000 mousetraps all with a ping pong ball on them. Uh, and it, I don't know how many days it took to set them up, but they just someone just dropped a ping pong ball. And you see everywhere, 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 everything gets destroyed. Uh, and ultimately, if we have free radical pathology running loose in our system, which, by the way, the way we make energy is called oxidative phosphorylation. So we need those processes. But if it gets out of control, it'll kill us and it'll kill us in short order. So we, we need that. But, you know, maybe the reason vitamin C got so much press is all but four mammals uh, have the ability to synthesize vitamin C from glucose. And we, we have plenty of glucose in our system. And if we don't, we can make it from amino acids. Uh, and they found out and Linus Pauling, the only guy ever to have won two Nobel prizes unshared. He wrote extensively about vitamin C. He took about 18 grams a day, 18,000 milligrams a day. Uh, and he was still publishing scientific papers in his late 90s and highly productive. Uh, and, and here's what he said. He said, you know what, if we take a 150 pound goat and we put it under stress uh, and keep in mind that a goat's a pretty good analogy for a human. A pig is, by the way, a much better analogy. Uh, but <laughs> that goat would make about 15 grams uh, of vitamin C on a stressful day. So, you know, we right. know it's life critical. We can't make it. We have to get it from somewhere else. And, you know, if, if people have been looking around or not, they might realize our food is not what it used to be. Our soils don't have what they once had. We are not getting the vitamins and minerals and we're falling apart for it. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. And I hear that. So it, vitamin C, they have two electrons, right? So they can give away against the free radicals, right? Instead of it, one, most it, antioxidants has one. Is that correct? I, it, it's an electron donor, yes, and and oh, yeah. so it can it can give one easily, uh, without suffering damage, uh, and and that's yeah. a, a pretty amazing process. So you know, it's like you got a big bank account, and I'm a little low on cash, and you know, you you flip me a grand or two, and I go, well, thank you, but you don't even miss it, uh, and that's a good analogy right. there. <laughs> yeah, that's really good, actually. And I also heard I don't know if you heard of this before, but I heard that sharks they can produce 400 grams per 70 kilo body weight. And sharks are the only animal they haven't discovered cancer in yet. Well, and they think they might be, uh, you know. You know I, it's wonderful that you looked into that. I hadn't studied sharks and, and vitamin C, but I'll, I'll share a different vitamin C story. So there's a famous explorer named Ernest Shackleton and, and his voyage was well, he was going to be the first person to cross the South Pole with sled dogs on foot. Uh, and they got shipwrecked in ice and his crew was there for 19 months. Uh, and they, yeah. everyone survived. One guy lost one foot from frostbite, which I couldn't imagine cutting off a foot without any anesthesia, right? I don't know if they knocked the guy out or whatever they did, but nonetheless... Uh, I, yeah. I was thinking, I'm, I'm reading through this, and I said to myself, how did these guys not die of scurvy? How was that even right. possible? You know, and then you go and look it up. They ate a lot of penguin meat. Penguin meat, super high in vitamin C. Uh, you know, wow. that shark connection has, has just taken a whole different angle with that vitamin C. I had right. no idea they made that much. For years, they were trying to talk about shark cartilage. Uh, you know, but one thing I want to tell you, we want to be kind to those sharks. You know, they've been around for <laughs> probably millions, if not billions of years. Yes. Uh, and that's probably really good for our ecosystem and a good example for us. 100%. Yes, it's, it's probably something there that if if these animals put under stress or get injured or sick, whatever, produce a lot of vitamin C and we can't produce it. Probably a good idea to, to you know, ramp up that little... I think in Sweden it's 75 milligrams a day, <laughs> which is, you know, rather, I, I'm, I'm up there with, with that guy you talked about, don't remember his name now, but I'm taking between 10 and 20 grams a day too, every hour. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, I, yeah, it's changed so much in, in my body, it's crazy good. Anyway, so I want to ask you this. Vitamin C, talked about that. Vitamin D is different, but so let's, let me ask you this. What's the differences in vitamin intake between an average person and an athlete? 
Because I guess when you hear that, let's well, vitamin C, you're going to take 75 milligrams. I, I guess this has been, you know, they've done studies about this. So it has to come from somewhere, right? So, and I guess it's not for athletes because they use a lot more stress and, you know, oxidations on their bodies. So what's the difference in the vitamin I intake between the average person and an athlete, you think? Well, let, let's just use the term high performer. Because right. if you're using your brain, if you're using your body, if you're using whatever, you're, you're going to need more. The more you want out of your body, the more you want to put in your body. But let's just go to Anders Ericsson for a moment. You know, great Swede. He wrote the book Peak. He studied the best of the best, whether we're talking about athletes, musicians, chess masters. And here's what they found. They slept 8.6 hours a night consistently, period, end of story, way more than the average person. So think about right. that. If you need to recover more, and they did, wouldn't you also need to replenish more? Uh, and you do, you know. And Andreas, I've worked, I've been blessed to have worked with Hall of Famers in nearly every sport. And here's what I'll tell you: they realized that they needed to do more, uh, and, and not just more than the average person, more than the average athlete. So they were profoundly diligent with their supplementation. And, and I often tell a story and, and profoundly coachable as well. You know, when I first saw Vander Holyfield, he had a sinus infection. He had a fight at the end of the week. Uh, you, you can't breathe through your mouth in a fight. You don't want that mouth open. That jaw is unstable. So if you can't breathe through your nose, guess what? You're going to have a hard time getting through, you know, even a few rounds with the barrage that those people throw and take. <laughs> yeah. so I, you know, I gave him some herbs to get rid of his infection. And by the way, one of them was, was Reishi, Ganoderma. Uh, and I, I said, here, take these every hour. Well, he came in two days later. I said, how you doing? He said, well, my sinuses are a lot better, but I'm really tired. And I said, why are you tired? He said, well, I'm up every hour taking those nutrients. So <laughs> yeah, I had to, I had to change my language to every waking hour. And, you know, yeah, I remember every waking. Like yesterday, because here's what we know about the elite. If they understand that they have a credible source with a good track record, they follow it to the letter. Uh, and that's consistent right. with Hall of Famers. Wow. <laughs> it's funny, though. That's incredible. So he actually got up every hour during the night to take. I he love had an that. alarm set 24 hours a day. <laughs> Boom, it goes off. He's taking them. Oh, wow. That's incredible. But that says a lot about elite athletes. That's that's the way they are. Um, so if you talk about like, um, do like regular non Pro athlete, non elites athletes, like regular person, like you and me today, we're not like pro pro athlete, we train like athlete maybe, but do regular people need to take as much as athletes? No, no, that's a simple answer, right? But malnutrition, number one cause of death on the planet. But but here's what we know, you know, there's what we call a point of diminishing return. You take a little more, you know, and you're not going to get much more out of it. Well, that athlete threshold is much much higher. You know, they, right. they are going to need, let, let's just look at overall energy output because energy is nutrient dependent, period, end of story. Whether right. you're using uh, stored up ATP, you've got to recycle that. If you're using creatine phosphate, you've got to recycle that. If you've got anaerobic glycolysis, there's actually 12 different enzyme steps in anaerobic glycolysis, each requiring a nutrient, but then you have to buffer that lactic acid. And then finally, yeah. when we go with what's known as oxidative phosphorylation. So that massive word of, of oxidation again, that's how we make energy. Right. Uh, it's yeah. 22 steps in that electron transport chain, all wow. requiring some type of nutrient, by the way, including biomolecules. So for instance, CoQ10, not a vitamin, but it's critical for energy and we need to be able to make it. Oh, wow. That's incredible. So I think that's pretty straight on. I think, yeah, people, uh, everyone needs to do this. And the follow-up question would be, and what, what, put it this way, does it matter if I take it in the morning, if I take it with food, we're talking vitamins now, like every vitamin, does it matter if I take it in the morning with food or does it matter uh, at all when I take it or not? Depends on the form you're putting in your body, you know, so okay. the most bioavailable forms are probably still even going to be better with food, but not as critical. Uh, but, okay. you know, and, and then we, we start looking at that and you and I have discussed this concept of intermittent fasting. We both love it. We both see the benefit. Uh, by the way, Nobel Prize winning research, the benefits of uh, intermittent fasting, autophagy, 
when your body has to feed on itself, and we do in those fasting states, what does it feed on? It doesn't feed on your muscle. It doesn't feed on your brain. It feeds on sick and dying, and believe it or not, even pre-malignant, precancerous, and cancerous cells. Uh, and who doesn't want to get rid of those things? You know, so we weed our garden every day in that fasting state. But once we start putting things in, if you're putting in high quality vitamin minerals in absorbable forms, bioactive forms, they're fine to take by themselves. You know, minerals don't come alone in nature. They're bound to different uh, amino acid chelates. Those are the best forms. Uh, and, you know, over the last several decades, been, there's been a lot more talk about activated B vitamins. Probably the most famous is going to be methylfolate. And they've come to realize, you know, there's about one third of our population. If you give them folic acid, it's completely worthless. They're not able to activate it. There's a high portion that need the methyl form of B12 or, or possibly an adenosyl or hydroxy form, but certainly not cyanocobalamin, which is the cheap form, the, you know, the form that people yeah. get. So quality yeah. absolutely matters. And Andreas, timing does matter uh, to, to a certain degree, right? So closer to food is going to be better for your overall digestive system, but you can surpass that with extreme quality and bioavailability. Will vitamins break fast? So if you take just supplements in the morning and you do an intermittent fasting, will that break the fast or no? No, no. no. Vitamin, vitamins by themselves won't. Even fiber, okay, well, you know? So I have some biohacks for, for fasting. You know, one, one is our, our wonderful coffee, right? Which is loaded with, coffee itself is loaded with antioxidants. We have reishi infused, ganoderma infused. That doesn't break the fast either. But uh, there's people that say, Bob, I, I, I just am not there yet. My, I don't have the discipline to do it. How can I cheat without cheating? And I have them get a really good form of fiber, mix it in hot water so it's gelatinous like pudding. It might be sweetened a little bit with sugar alcohol, which is non-caloric. They can take that. They cannot break their fast, but yet satisfy their appetite. Uh, and, and I think that's a good strategy to do that. So is it really like if you don't put in a calories in, you, you don't break your fast? Is that a simple way to put it or no? Yeah, or even less than 10 calories, you know? Oh, so it's okay. very slight things, right? Right, right. Got it. And which vitamins do not mesh well or should you be taken together? Does it matter? Well, the vitamins are all synergistic. That's the beauty of it. You look at nature, they're all going to become packaged together. But if you don't have the right chelates, and it's really more of the mineral issue, uh, right, you know, okay. minerals can have some level of absorptive antagonism. But if we follow nature, if they're all put in a way where they're packaged together, you know, not in a, in a raw mineral form, but with something to it, the body has found a way around that. Uh, so, you know, nature's God's foods, nature's foods, very synergistic. When you start supplementing with things that man tweaked a little bit, well, now you have the potential for antagonism a lot more with minerals and vitamins. But right. and, and so Andreas, you... I, I actually, I yeah. do want to say something. So uh, oddly enough, if someone takes an inactive form of folic acid, which is folic acid, as opposed to methylfolate, sometimes right. there can be competition for the transport mechanism. So they may not even get the best of their activated form. So uh, if you're taking inactive forms, it becomes a concern. So would, would it be... Is it a different sound now? Is it still good? My yeah, a little, is... you had a little echo there, but uh, we're still good. We're still good. Okay, because my I don't know why she switched from this super mic to my computer. But anyway, uh, hope this is okay. So, would it, so the next question will be like, so during my last meal, should I take my vitamins with my last meal, or should I take it closer to sleep? I would take it with your last meal. You know, uh, okay. e even though it's it's going to be certainly better than a meal, what they're suggesting two or optimally three hours to be your last food intake before yeah. sleep for, for a lot right. of different reasons. But, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite terms for sleep now is they're now calling it mental floss, not dental floss, but mental floss, because that mm -hmm. brain's going through some serious detox. And if you've got your body focused on something else like digestion and absorption and, and assimilation, that takes away some of the energy and focus for your brain to clean itself out. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. This is like, this is so interesting. Um, 
So let's touch just a little bit on minerals because so, a lot of people uh, talk about magnesium and we know magnesium is crucial. And we, we've heard that magnesium will make you maybe fall asleep easier and will sleep better. So would that be something you would take, you want to take like with last meal or you wouldn't take magnesium a little bit later considering it's help you fall asleep or you get more tired or you get a little, you know? Well, one, I love magnesium and, and it's one of the top deficiencies that's absolutely out there. Uh, by the way, magnesium, the best source is going to be plants. The central molecule of chlorophyll is magnesium. That's very, very similar. That's the lifeblood of plants. The central molecule of hemoglobin, the lifeblood of humans is actually iron. So magnesium has calming benefits, but understand some forms of magnesium are going to be more calming than others. Some can even be a little stimulating like magnesium aspartate, magnesium glycinate, uh, and some are nearly worthless like magnesium oxide. You know, you put that in, you get a laxative. So, uh, you know, form counts. And, and when you take it, if I were going to take magnesium for sleep, magnesium taurate, taurine is an amino acid that's critical for the conversion of glutamate, the most excitatory or wake me up brain chemical to GABA, the most calming or, or help me go to sleep brain chemical. But my favorite for that is actually melatonin. Uh, and so what would probably make a greater impact is to actually have an electronic fast, stay away from that blue light and, and maybe even e EMFs for at least an hour before bed or longer. Uh, and I think people will sleep better. I have one for you. Three, two, one. Three hours before bed, no food. Two hours before bed, no fluids. One hour before bed, no electronics. I like it. Did you just right? make that on the fly or is that been one of your uh, one of your guidelines? <laughs> oh, did you see that one? Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I love it. People, <laughs> yeah. You know what? People, people like stuff like that. Three, two, one. I got it. I got yeah. it. Uh, that's great. So let's, let's take like an average person, non pro athlete, um, which vitamins are like, cause we have like a, a B, C, D, E, we got K, we got a lot of vitamins. Which one do we like really need to supplement? Well, one, I'm going to say all of them, <laughs> but okay. you know, when, when we have a lot of things coming around from around the world, you know, you mentioned vitamin C, is that the most studied or is it vitamin D? They found that every single cell type of the body has vitamin D receptors. And quite simply, that means that's critical for every process that we have. They're estimating that there's something like a billion people globally that have full-blown vitamin D deficiency, which is horrible. Uh, and by the way, I'm not aware of any vitamin D toxicity, even though it's fat soluble and stored. I, I tell people that, you know, the, the, the labs that we measure them, they have a guideline. They say, oh, you know, don't go above 100 with the units that we use here. Then I go to the NIH and the animal studies, then they raised animal levels to over 400 without toxic levels. So it's fascinating that the, the, Fine print before it says, below the article says, well, considered potentially toxic above 100, but animal studies don't show that. Now, do we need 400? No. You know, I, I like that 100 to 120 sweet spot. You're going to be fine there. But what vitamins do they need? All of them. So, you know, about every decade, they, pub they publish the Global Nutrition Report. And by the way, the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association was also publishing what they called actual causes of death. Uh, and oddly enough, they don't have the 2020 version yet, but in 2010, poor diet was number one. They had lack of exercise further down the line. And uh, interestingly enough, then they put, you know, obesity, high cholesterol, high blood sugar uh, above the uh, lack of exercise, right? Uh, and I said, wait a minute, poor diet, lack of exercise is the cause of obesity, is the cause <laughs> of blood, is the cause of cholesterol. So it turned out, you know, 2.1 million deaths, poor diet, lack of exercise. So, you know, that's our synergy. You know, one, you're great with nutrition, but you're grayer with exercise. Me, I'm pretty good with nutrition, uh, but I look up to you for that, that guidance on movement. Yeah. I mean, you can't do just one thing. You need to do everything. That's, uh, we know that is, um, it's, uh, it's never one thing. That's what I want to talk about this because it's never one vitamin. If you just take vitamin C, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, we need we need a whole package. So if you take, you say you, you need everything, you need all of them. Um, 
So what what is it like a, if we talk diet, we talk food here. So if you want to have like a good range of, of vitamins, get all of them in there. What should I like? What What's the good tip for, for eating? Because uh, you and I just eat, I eat like twice a day, uh, but more, uh, the bigger proportions. And I do a shake with um, some good stuff in. I might tell people later what I have in it. It's um it's good stuff but it's not if my kids do, do not like it <laughs> i've been, been trying liam he's you know he's getting a little bit older now so he's getting used to it noel is struggling a little bit but he's 16 he's, he will come around but he's taking them but i'm not their favorite when i when, when they have this shake every day but it's it's good stuff um but anyway so what kind of food let's say you have intermittent fasters out there or we can also add breakfasters as well. I just came up with a new English word, maybe breakfasters. People who eat breakfast. Pretty smart, right? <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. What, what do you What would you suggest for for breakfast, lunch, dinner, or and for intermittent fasters? Well, keep in mind, I can talk about this for about two days or longer, right? So, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. So, Hippocrates said, yeah. "Let thy food be thy medicine." Lucretius said, one man's food's another man's poison. I say that today, most men's food is a poison for all humanity. Jack LaLanne said, if God made it, it's okay. Uh, you know, and if man made it, stay away. Michael Pollan said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Now, if we were to combine everything in one statement, here's this long statement, eat real food, clean food, not too much, not too often, every color, every day in a way that honors your physiology, your genetics, and your body goals, mostly plants. So, you know, we could unpack that all the way through, but real food, not this fake stuff. You know, there, there's so many chemicals in food. And Andreas, you're going to love this quote. Uh, and you probably love Judy Mikovits. You know, she's a, a sage of wisdom. She was featured in the movie Plandemic, just a brilliant PhD researcher. Uh, and she and I co-lectured at a conference a month ago in Florida. She said, don't count calories, count chemicals. Uh, and there are chemicals now defined for over 25 years that are in almost all the food that we eat that they call obesogens because you can't get anything pure anymore. And there are also endocrine disruptors. So the less clean your food source you're going to disrupt your hormones, especially the sex steroids and especially insulin then throw in thyroid and you know that's going to spill over on growth hormone as well. Uh, and then you've got things that just promote fat storage and people don't want that. So if you want to have balanced hormones and an ideal body composition, that food's got to be clean. Now, why every color every day? It's foolish to think that all of nutrition is vitamins and minerals. You know, it's actually not just the plant chemicals. There's over 4,000 named bioflavonoids, and those are in colorful fruits and vegetables. But there's also a message, uh, uh, energetic message in the plants. They use this term xenohormesis, foreign messages. But when a plant is grown in an organic circumstance, when it actually has to develop an immune system to fight for its own life, when we eat that plant, we get that life. And I'll, I'll tell a story that will spill it to animals too. So I did a fire walk with an Indian chief a little over 20 years ago. Maybe it's even closer to 30 years now. You know, we, we, we had this wonderful Indian ceremony, made this fire, walked across coals. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's pretty doggone amazing. But he would talk about the Indians, you know, and when they would take out a buffalo, that buffalo was a brother. Uh, and it was actually serving the entire community and when you eat a strong animal, you get that animal's strength. When you eat a wise animal, you get that animal's wisdom. When you, when you eat something that never had to develop any level of character or strength, you don't get any character or strength from it. Uh, and sadly, that's what people are eating. And we just have to look around to see the results of that. It's not good. I 100% agree. And I think I think this is a good one for you. I, I, I don't I'm not sure if I come up with it or if I stole it, I probably stole it from somewhere. I don't care because it's still good. Because um, a lot of people say you are what you eat, right? Yep. I would say this, you are what you eat. 
eat. Oh, well, that's that's a step further. Andreas, I'm going to take it a little further, too. Okay. We're not what we eat. We are what we absorb. You know, we are what we eat. That's somewhat true. You are what you absorb. That's more true. You are what you don't eliminate. That's most true. Right, uh, right. So Brilliant. now we look at these chemicals. Our body doesn't have good ways to get rid of them for the most part. Some of these things have a half-life of decades in the environment. We put them in our body. We have a heck of a time clearing them out. Wow. Yeah, that's true. So you say every color uh, every day. So because people talk a lot about you need to uh, have a lot of variations when it comes to nutrition. Right? But could I eat like pretty much the same stuff every day if, it, if I have all colors and mostly plants? great quality, good proteins. Can I have pretty much the same dish every day? Well, you're, you're going to potentially run into some challenges by not having variety, you know? And, and okay. so very, very simply, it's like your training routine. If you did the exact same thing, what's going to happen? You know, you're going to completely and totally adapt. And, you know, now you have a little bit of a challenge, but here's what I can tell you. You know, I'll go to the journal advances in therapy they took people age matched, health matched, and they actually extracted from the tissue samples where they could test the amount of nutrition in the tissue. They gave one group a really good macronutrient balanced, every color, every day, organic diet. The other group got the same diet, but they added supplementation. They went back in months later, uh, and the people that got only food did not improve their nutrition status at all. Uh, and in fact, even some went down. Now, when they added supplementation, they improved their nutrient reserve. So one of the conclusions from the article was food is too weak to replete depleted cells and bodies. Therefore, supplementation is advisable for everyone. So that you know, was organic. Yeah, that was organic. Wow. Well, and Andreas, so I, I here, here's a, an interesting thing. So uh, organic farms don't use fertilizers like NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So there's a sage of wisdom. He's a, he's a, you know, certainly a Facebook friend and we've had personal conversations. So I'll even call him a friend after that, Nathan Bryant. He was on the uh, Nobel prize winning research team that discovered nitric oxide. They decided to test fruits and vegetables, organic, non-organic all over the U S for nitrate content. And what they found was that organic fruits and vegetables were actually much lower in nitrate Nitrate in the body becomes nitrite, becomes nitric oxide. And what they've come to realize is, you know, even the organic farms are going to have to get some good bioavailable form of nitrogen back in the soil because it's not getting back. It's being depleted. Uh, and that's just more the idea that even if we supplement really or, or eat really clean, we need to supplement effectively as well. Wow. All right, so so we're back to we we like the movement variability. We need food variability, and we need to supplement. Okay, we we're getting somewhere here, man. I like this. This is so good. Uh, is there any particular food that will make um, help the the vitamins to absorb better in our bodies? So let's let's say I do like I do vitamin D, vitamin C, D three, K two, and uh, yeah, that's the supplements I take for vitamins. I think maybe it's a couple of more. I don't know. Let's say well, those. Sure. Is there so, any particular food that would absorb the vitamins better to in my body or no? Well, quite possibly. So, uh, you know, I'm going to even go back three decades on this one. One of my great mentors early on said more people suffer malnutrition or sorry, malabsorption than malnutrition. So there's plenty of people that have digestive inefficiency, starting with hydrochloric acid. Uh, and Andres, you know, I think we have a, a similar group of audience that want to want to know some of the details. So I tell people, you know, hydrochloric acid is a byproduct of blood in our body. There's special cells called the parietal cells that make it. But blood has a pH of 7.35, hydrochloric acid 0 0.8. If I were to take a drop of hydrochloric acid, drop it on the desk in front of me, it'd burn a hole in it. The reason it doesn't burn a hole in my gut is because I have great mucus. But Andreas, here's where I'm going on this rant. To get from 7.35 to 6.35 in pH, that's a logarithmic scale. It's a factor of 10. To 5.35, a factor of 100. 4.35, 1,000. 3.35, 10,000. 2.35, 100,000. 1.35, a million. 0 0.8, the hydrogen ion concentration 
of hydrochloric acid, 3 million times of that of arterial blood. So leading biochemists suggest it takes 600% more energy to make hydrochloric acid than any other chemical in our body. So it's going to be the first thing that drops. And by the way, when it drops, that's when we're prone to acid reflux. So when we nourish our parietal cells, and basically there's a category of herbs and almost across the board, with, without exception, bitter herbs, and by the way, coffee is a bitter herb as well, uh, can actually enhance hydrochloric acid production. That's one of the benefits of them. Uh, and so we see that there's a lot of people, in fact, you know, somewhere around 80% of people that don't tolerate coffee don't because it gives them a burning of their gut. Uh, but right. now we, we found a way around that, right? We buffer it with, with reishi, the most alkaline food on the planet, uh, which by the way, also enhances parietal cell function. So the very general answer is going to be any food or supplement that contains the nutrients that will support the electron transport chain and those 22 components will help. Some of those components are CoQ10, which guess what? If you impair your liver, you're not going to make CoQ10. If you take statins, you're really impaired in CoQ10. So bitter herbs in general, nutrient-dense food in general, but there's this concept of food combining. Uh, and so, you know, this, this has been described for, for many, many decades. And one of my great mentors said, you know what? I'll be able to look at you a decade from now and tell if you've been combining your food properly. So fruits should be eaten alone. Uh, uh, vegetables are very flexible. You can combine them with starches and you can combine them with proteins, but starches and proteins have antagonistic digestion. So really combination and nutrient dense food and bitter herbs will be the answer that we're looking for there to enhance all digestion and absorption. Oh, wow. What an answer. So you remember I was telling in the beginning of this episode as he's one of the smartest guys on the planet when it comes to, to functional medicine. Now you know, all right? That answer was, wow. You, you never stopped to surprise me with your knowledge. It's incredible. I'm so impressed, man. Thank you so much for that. Paul, so, I'm best. you know what, man? I, I got to tell you, our world needs this information probably more than ever. So I, I'm glad to partner with you to bring it to them. A hundred percent. Yeah, I want to do uh, everything I can. And I know you want to do everything you can. And together, hopefully we can help some people can we just make one one guy survive amazing um and i mean hopefully we can make a lot of a lot of people healthier and happier um so so we tried to focus on vitamins only here is there we know that human body can <clears throat> cannot make sorry cannot produce their own vitamin c uh, i know that vitamin d we can store vitamin d right is and it we better can make it. to have, and we can make it, yeah, true. And we can make it. Uh, we can make it, we can get it from the sun. Do we, is it better to store it? Like, let's say I take, we have different units here in Sweden. So I, I'm, I'm taking like between 10 and 20,000 units a day. Is it better to take a lot more on like Sundays and then store it for a week? Or does it matter? Or is it better to take it every day to keep it fl flowing like? Well, so keep in mind the fat soluble ones, A, D, E, and K, those are the ones that we're going to store. Uh, and, yeah. you know, Michael Hollock has been just a great proponent of vitamin D and, and looked at so much research. And he actually found that to build reserves, bolus doses are better. You know, they might dose 100,000 units, 200,000 units, uh, you know, and those are for depleted people to get better. But, but that's not really how we are designed. We are designed to get it every single day. But here's another fascinating fact. Even though we can make vitamin D, we need good sunshine on bare skin and preferably at the midpoint of the day, early morning, you're not going to make that, that vitamin D, but then you need good skin, you need good liver, you need good kidney. And even if all those things are good, after the age of 40, our vitamin D production drops off very substantially. Uh, and, and so I, I read an article on vitamin D that pointed that out. And they said, you know what, maybe that's nature's way of thinning the herd, you know, because uh, <laughs> let's, let's face it, the, when we look at our biology, you know, and you've done a good job with it, you've got three magnificent children. I'm a little ahead of you. I've got three magnificent children, four granddaughters, you know, all wonderfully healthy and, and on a great path. 
But for the most part, our biologic function is complete. Now, can we still add value? Well, we humans can, especially if we grow the wisdom over time uh, and then pass it on in, in a way that empowers our youth to, to take things to a further level than we ever did. Absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree more, but that, that is funny. What, did it, uh, what if that's true, that after 40, we're done? No more. We need new people. <laughs> That is funny. So do you have anything else you want to share when it comes to your vitamins uh, that you think is important for, for people to know that you're thinking about on top of your head? Well, Andres, we have to support companies that are, that are providing good quality. And, and, you know, one of the discussions we had at that conference with, with Judy Mikovits is the pharmaceutical companies are offering outrageous money to buy up nutrition companies. Now, I might ask you the question, is our healthy people a conflict of interest to the pharmaceutical industry? You know, we might think it is. So the idea is that they are not supporting the quality uh, and therefore by putting out an inferior product, they'll sell more of their high margin items. You know, there, there's very little markup on nutraceuticals, but drugs, you can, you can mark them up 10,000 X. So if you were a smart businessman, what if you just bought up the competition, bought up the competition and destroyed it? So we want to support companies that are committed to the highest quality. Uh, and if we support them, then, then we're going to have high quality. If we don't, we're going to be really, really challenged. Right. So true. Yeah. So quality, we want quality. Everything we do, we want quality. So, but I think this question is pretty, pretty important too. What do you say to people that, that don't have, um, like, let's say they have like maybe between 30 and $50 a month to spend on, on supplementing. Um, what should they focus on? Like, let's, let's forget, we take vitamins and minerals now or anything else, whatever. Let's say you have like between 30 and $50 a month to spend on supplementation. What would you recommend then to start with? What's, what's the key here? Well, I would prioritize clean food, right? Count uh, chemicals, not calories, and, and also focus on organic. And, and people can run out of money pretty quick. Uh, and so that's just the reality of this world. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Find out whatever you're passionate about, develop a level of expertise, and get a side hustle where you invest back into your better self. You know, I was listening to a longevity podcast the other day. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and this researcher said, look, I think that most people at best, at best, are operating at about 50% of their potential. Uh, yeah. And if they took on the right strategies, let's face it, you know, you're a high achiever, but you're at 50%. What if you could knock yourself up another 10%, which you consistently do, then we get there. But what are we going to do? We've got to eat really clean. We've got to eat organic. And then we're going to go with a really complete either superfood because superfoods have all the fabulous 50 or super high quality vitamin and mineral chelate and focus on that. But it, let's face it, if, if you don't have money, we, we've got a lot of challenges going on. And probably what it is, is you're not living to your fullest. You haven't found your passion uh, and you know what, that's what you and I are here to do, help people get better, find their passion and find their unique niche to add value. And we reap what we sow. However you add value, it'll come back. Uh, and who knows, maybe, maybe you just like, I, I don't want to use, use, use the example on this, you're, you're, you're training billionaires, you know? Uh, and, and so do you think this billionaire might say, hey, Andreas, I, I got your food, I got your supplements, right? So be of service in some way that allows you to optimize yourself. And ultimately that is going to be find your passion and really develop it to the best of your capacity. I love that. Cause I think that, uh, I mean, yeah, I totally agree that probably it's lower than 50% that have reached their maximum capacity. Uh, and it's, I've started, uh, it's, I'm sorry, Bob, this in Swedish. I've started a Facebook group with uh, my mentor in mental training. It's called mindset 2.0 and we would try to help like people to 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 get better and perform better and do better uh, and work with their mindset to do exactly what you just said. 
but we were just right now talking in that group about people are scared to take the step to they want to make more money and they want to go and do something different because they're not really happy what they are doing right now with their job or their work uh, but they're so scared of the financial they're so scared to take that step of following their passion because they have like the secure job and I got my salary and uh, every month and I got kids and um so I I totally buy that what you're saying that it's less than 50 percent well and and then let, let's just look at that for a moment we have all growth is going to occur out of our comfort zone you know when you train athletes hey you're going to push them and when you push them, yeah. you expand their energy capacity, you expand the strength of the muscle fibers, the contractility of the muscle fibers, the efficiency of the nervous system, the strength and function and cross-linking of the tendons, their bones become more dense. But I'll tell you what, that doesn't happen without a load. Uh, and, and so one thing that this guy was talking about is very, very simply, you know, work on your breathing first, get uncomfortable breathing, hold your breath to a very uncomfortable level. And believe it or not, you're going to expand that capacity. And the next breath you can take in deeper and you can get a little more efficiency out of the cells, but everything builds on everything else. But hey, we're not talking about throw caution to the wind. If you've got a good job and you, you've got good cash flow and it's able to, for you to create your great lifestyle, get that side hustle uh, and grow it slowly. And ultimately, hopefully that side hustle can become your main deal if that's what you're really passionate about. A hundred percent. I agree. And I think that, that too, like to, to be, be ready to, to be comfortable without uncomfortable. Um, and you, you build character, I think like, and you said one thing I can, I can add, uh, take like a cold shower in the morning. When you, when you do take, I think pretty much everyone takes a shower in the morning. Try to end with like, start with 10 seconds and literally you don't have to be super cold the first first day, but try to be uncomfortable. And then you get comfortable with the uncomfortable. You will challenge yourself. You will be, get more used to being uncomfortable. And after a while, getting uncomfortable is getting, is more comfortable. And you set yourself up for success easier by challenge yourself. And I think that's uh, that's how I started to, to, to do um cold showers i started with like 10 seconds and it was not really cold at all uh and then i just expand that i still i don't do more than one minute today either um but you i know, just really, but it, you know I, I swim every morning and i've got a nice pool here in houston texas and it's hard to call that a cold plunge but we have about three months of the year where it's cold plunge but i'll tell you <laughs> what i'm a lot better swimming all out for as long as I do, rather than standing there. So the people that can just stand there, they're tougher than I am. I'm <laughs> sprinting in place if I'm in the shower, you know? Right. So I'm, get, I'm kind of getting a two for one on that one. Right, 100%, yeah. And that's really smart. You can try that too, if you're listening to this. So I try to sprint in the shower if it's really cold. <laughs> Make sure you're not great. slippery though, right? You have some kind of shower that's, mat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Taking a spill there. Yep, smart, smart ad there. Perfect. Um, all right. I think that's, uh, that's what I had for vitamins. If you don't have anything you want to add, I think that's another brilliant, uh, not as long episode, but still brilliant. And I think I would like to do more of these little shorter ones, but, you know, and focus on one topic and you just expand from there. And then maybe um, a few years from now, we can just wrap it up and then, and we have everything we need to be happy and healthy and successful. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Well, again, my friend, thank you so much for taking your time. I know you're really busy and I appreciate this. And I know it will help a lot, a lot of people. And that's my passion to help as many people as I can feel better, perform better and, and you know, be more successful. Thank well, you. You're, you're phenomenal at it. And I'm going to thank you right back. You know, so I, I don't know how much time passed, but our time just flies because we've got so much synergy uh, and, pa and passion for making the world better. So let, let's keep bringing this. And I like that idea. One topic at a time, more digestible. Right. Love it. All right. Till next time, Bob, uh, give my best to your family. Tell them I love them. I love you. Thank you. And take care, man. Thank you, Andreas. See you, man.